I'm sure uh, many or all of you, no matter what your age, have probably watched Wheel of Fortune a time or two in life. It's been on the air continuously for 40 plus years. So that goes way back, uh, Pat and Vanna. And, uh, uh, and if you've watched it, you might know what a double entendre is. Because they have them on there. I haven't watched it in a long time, but they have a double entendre. So if you don't know what a double entendre is, and I surprised myself because I asked Terry last night, and she didn't know what it was. I thought, oh, I'm actually smarter than my wife sometimes. <laughs> At least I knew what that was. But I also had looked up the definition in Merriam-Webster this week, and entendre is a, uh, comes from a French word, which means to hear. So double, hear. And what it means, a double entendre, is a word or a phrase that has a double meaning. A double meaning. So if you look at loving obedience, that's our double entendre for this morning. And that's way more important than uh, knowing what a double entendre is. Loving obedience. And the question is this, do I love God enough to obey Him? Do I love God enough to be obeying Him with my life? Um, We're making our way through John's biography of the life of Jesus called The Gospel According to John. And uh, he was, it's important to realize, he was an eyewitness. He spent about three years with Jesus. Uh, He watched Jesus die. He gave up hope, thought it was all over. Uh, And then he was around and saw Jesus after Jesus had risen from the dead. And so he's an eyewitness of these events. And they so impacted him and his life that he wrote them down and then uh, wanted other people to know uh, about Christ and to be able to have life. Because it's more than just a history lesson. It's more than just knowing some religious facts. In fact, what John has been telling us is that people that have never met Jesus, people that are alive in this century, can have an ongoing relationship with Jesus today. And that's why many people say that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Because we have an ongoing relationship uh, with Jesus. And we talked about that last week uh, rather extensively through the Holy Spirit. And that message and all other messages, most of them, are on YouTube at Faith Outpost Sermons. They can be found on our Faith Outpost Facebook page or by going to faithoutpostchurch.org and clicking on listen to a recent sermon. And that'll actually take you to that whole YouTube library. So anyway, you can uh, catch up on that if you've missed that. So Jesus is saying, even though to his disciples, because we're, what we are in context here is that this is Thursday night before he was crucified on Friday. And he knows he's going to be crucified And he's preparing them for that. And he also knows that after he raises from the dead, he's going to ascend back to heaven. So he's going to go away in death and come back in life. But then he's going to go away again. And he's preparing them for that. And he's telling them, I am sending you one that is like me. And uh, he's going to be with you in spirit forever. And he'll actually live within you. And you'll have this ongoing life-giving relationship Uh, with me through the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying, look, he says, guys, this is not a long-distance relationship. You know, I'm I'm currently in a long-distance relationship with my son who's in Japan. And so thanks to the Internet, you know, with uh, texting or video conferencing, we can touch base with him. But it's it's a long-distance relationship. And some people might think of Jesus in heaven, okay, a relationship, long-distance relationship. No, well, what Jesus wants us to know is that he's here. He's here through his spirit. And there's a literal relationship, just like the disciples had with Jesus for those three years. He's preparing them, and he's telling them, guys, we're going to have an ongoing, better relationship. It's to your advantage, he tells them, that I go away. And I'm like, if I was there, I'm thinking like, yeah, right. You know, you, you've been our rock. You've been our teacher. You, you've been everything to us. And you, we've, we've watched you do miracles. And, and you're saying it's better for us if you're gone? And Jesus is saying, yeah, because when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit will come. And he'll actually take up residence within every person that has trusted in Jesus Christ. So it's not a long-distance relationship. God is, is out there, but when you come to know Christ, he's in here. 
And, and so it's not just here, around me, next to me, down the street, or in a building that's called a church. Uh, it's personal, and we have an ongoing give-and-take relationship with him. So, um, we're going to look at John 14, scripture passage for today, John 14, 15 to 31. Uh, we read these, uh, most of these verses last week. We're going to read them again. Last week, we focused on the verses that talked about the Holy Spirit. And this week, we're going to talk, focus on verses that talk about, like in verse 25, that starts off, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot receive him. Uh, That's the unbelieving world, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you, and before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day... You will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Iscariot, there was another one, uh, another Judas. But Lord, why do you intend to show us yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father And do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. So after Jesus rose from the dead, one of the uh, things that he did is that he, the disciples had gone out fishing on the Sea of Galilee, many of them. And Jesus shows up on the beach one morning and fixes breakfast with him. And I always think about that breakfast with the boys at the beach. Fixed breakfast for him. And, And then in the midst of that, he has a conversation with Peter. Now, keep in mind, Peter was the one that had denied that he knew Christ three different times on this night, Thursday night, that we're focusing on. Uh, It denied that he knew Christ. You're one of his followers. No, I'm not. You know, three different times. And so, uh, Jesus needs to restore Peter and and to give him that confidence and and restore the relationship and let him know that, uh, Peter, I'm I'm not done with you. Uh, we still can have this relationship. And so he takes Peter aside on that beach that day and says, Peter, three times, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Well, yeah, Lord. I'm thinking, you know, this isn't in the text. Why are you asking me again? (laughs) And then a third time. Peter, do you love me? I, I believe that was a penetrating question. And, and he, he's, he's not saying, Peter, you don't love me. But each time he said, you love me, then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Peter, you're going to be a leader in my church. And I want you to feed my flock. I want you uh, to share the, with the world what you know about me. Peter, you got to do it in love. Do you love me? Do you love me? And so Jesus says here on this night, it opens up of that verse 15, uh, if you love me, and he's saying this to them and by extension to us, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, my commands will be so important to you that you will know them and you will keep them. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, either on a highway 
or when it comes to what Jesus is telling us. So if Jesus were to sit down with you at a beach or at your back porch or in your den and say to you, do you love me? Do you love me? What would your honest answer have to be? Well, what would it be? You know, it's one thing to know that God loves us. And Jesus is uh, kind of turning it around uh, on his followers. And he's saying, you realize this is the first time. Do you love me? This is the first time in John's gospel where that is, is posed. If you love me, you will keep my command. So first thing we see in here is loving obedience, loving obedience. So uh, in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Um, and by the way, Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to help us. Like, for example, <laughs> Jesus said, uh, basically, if you love me, you'll, you'll forgive one another. You ever have a hard time forgiving somebody? Ever realize you need help? If you want me to forgive that person or those people like you've forgiven me, God, I, I, need, I need help with that. That, that, that. So that there's an example of a command that we just might need help with. Love one another like I have loved you. Wait a second. You want me to... I mean, do we even love our family like Jesus loves us? We could say, ah, much of the time, but not all the time, <laughs> right? You know, like, my love isn't perfect, and they're not perfect either, and sometimes those imperfections like grrr, come together and grind like broken clogs on a wheel. You know, like, oh, that's when the sparks fly, right? You know, love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not just your own family, but people that are not in your family. Love your enemy. Oh, wait a second. Okay, Jesus, you just took it a little bit too far. Do you know what they said about me? Do you know what they've done to me? Do you know what that boss did? Do you know what that company did? They fired me. They, you know, they took advantage. They, 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 I lost my pension. You want me to love my enemies? Yep. I don't think Jesus would bat an eye and say, yep, exactly right. Exactly right. And so there's commands. There, there are more than instructions, more than good ideas. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my command. Verse 21 of the same passage, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Notice keeps, keeps his present ongoing tense. It's not like, okay, I did that once. <laughs> Break my arm, patting myself on the back. You know, oh, yeah, I did that once. I, I was kind to that neighbor that wasn't kind to me. 25 years ago, you know. Notice this is present, ongoing action. Whoever keeps my command. So there, there's a practice to it, a practice, an ongoing lifestyle. And you're thinking, okay, you want me to do that? I need help. Well, that's, you know, the, the Holy Spirit. Now, think about it, friends. Think about it for a moment. If we all did that, if the two billion plus people that name Christianity, it's the largest religious body in the world, lived that way, took the commands seriously, wouldn't the world be a better place? Wouldn't it? So whoever keeps my commands, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So that's the second time. Verses 23 and 24 of the passage we read, uh, it says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. The Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So you can Reverse that around. Anyone who's not obeying my teaching, anyone who's not obeying my commands doesn't love me. Doesn't love me. These words you are, here, you are hearing are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And then verse 31, I love the Father and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. So I want to just kind of look at this, take a deep dive into this idea of 
being lo- loving God and being loved by him. And the first thing I, I, I want to clear up is this, is that our love for Jesus is not what causes him to love us. Our love, demonstrating love for him is not what causes him to love us. And, and just real quick, there's some verses in, uh, in Romans 5, 8, for example, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, before we ever came to faith in Christ, God loves us. Before, you could say, before we knew him, God was loving us. 1 John four nineteen says it like this, we love because he first loved us. 1 John three sixteen. this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And so what John is saying is you don't really know what love is until you come to know and experience the love of God, because it is, it is several levels, steps above any love that you've ever have on a human plane. God's love is better than the love of your spouse, your significant other, your mother, your father, your children, a child. It is that much better. So we had a cookout Thursday night. It was part of our Mother's Day because there's mothers and mothers-in-laws and, you know, with families and people that are married. So we, we got together Thursday night and had a cookout. And somewhere along the line, the uh, subject went to, you know, steak and that Kobe steak that they, Japanese it's kind of like, and I, I had a Kobe steak several years ago. And it's kind of like this. You've never had a steak until you've had a Kobe steak. And, and it's like that with Jesus. Some people are shaking your head. You've had it, right? And, and it's like that. You don't know what love is, really. This is what John is saying until you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ. That, that, that's what John is claiming. And he knew human love. He had a brother, Andrew. He had parents. He was the son of thunder. You know, Zebedee was his parent. And, and he, he knew that. But then he says, there's nothing like, nothing like the love of God. And so it's God's love for us that prompts us to love Jesus. He loves us first. And he's always loved us. Jeremiah 31.3 says this, The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I will continue to love you with an everlasting love because everlasting love lasts forever. In other words, there will never be a time that I don't love you. There will never be a circumstance that I don't love you. There's never anything that you can do to keep me from loving you. And by the way, there's nothing you can ever do that makes me love you either. I don't love you more if you obey. I don't love you less if you disobey. I love you because I love you. I don't love you because you have any other reason. I love you because I love you. I love you because I'm God, and John is the one who wrote this in 1 John. God is love. God is love. Everything that he does is born out of love. His love for us. And so it's his love for us that prompts us to love Jesus. God puts no conditions on his love. John also wrote this. It's kind of like 1 John. Okay, there's the gospel according to John. You know, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the first four documents, the gospels that we find in the New Testament. You know, after the end of the Old Testament that ends with Malachi. And then you start with Matthew, Mark, Luke. And here's a good distinction. The names that are more familiar to us, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, New Testament, Obadiah, Zechariah, Malachi, <laughs> Old Testament, you know. Names that are, that's not 100%, by the way, but names that are more familiar to us usually are in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John. And so John wrote the gospel according to John. John also wrote this eyewitness of Jesus, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Why are they called that? Because whoever named them that wasn't very creative. Okay, So just very simple. The, 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 by the way, the titles for these documents were not part of the original inspiration. They were just given so we could say, turn to 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And by the way, those are all towards the end of the New Testament. And then John is the author, humanly, of the book of Revelation as well. So John was a prolific writer. 
He wrote uh, five documents that we find in our New Testament. And it's like 1 John is a commentary on John. There's a good way to think of 1 John. It's a commentary. It's like he's thinking, there's some things I would have liked to have said that I want to clear up. I want to make more certain. I want you to know more about. I'm just going to expound on it a little bit more. And so we can always go to 1 John as commentary on John. And so here's some things about God's love. He says God's love is perfect. God's love is perfect. He says that in 1 John 4.18. There's no fear in love because, but perfect, or that word means complete, perfect, complete love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So John is, is saying now that punishment that he's talking about there is the fear of judgment, judgment day, the fear of Judgment on Judgment Day. Some people ought to fear judgment on Judgment Day. Other people don't need to. Those who are genuine followers of Jesus Christ do not need to fear judgment on Judgment Day. Why? John says because God's perfect love that we've experienced in Jesus Christ through faith in Him is driving out that fear. We have confidence before God. Because of that, Jesus. how is that so? Because Jesus took our punishment. Jesus took our judgment upon himself there on the cross. He was forsaken so that we could be accepted. He was judged so that we could be forgiven. He was judged for my sin being your sin, our sin, because our sin was placed upon him and he took the punishment that rightfully belongs to us so that he could give us the freedom that rightfully belongs to him. That's the power and the joy and, if you will, the magic of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so he has taken that. And so when, we're, when we have that assurance in our heart, that drives out fear. So God's love is perfect. There's no flaws in it. There's no failings in it. Do you know, it, since it talks about fear and love in this passage, you know both fear and love are experiential I bet you've been afraid in life. And I bet you have felt the fear. Chances are. Maybe it was a nightmare when you were a kid. Maybe it was a nightmare last night. Maybe uh, you were like me as a kid. I would lay in my bed at night in my bedroom. And I could lay there and there was a door here, a closet there, a window there, and a door there. And I could sit there like this and not move and see every one of them. Because like Bill Cosby taught me way back then, if you moved, you gave away your location. <laughs> and I could see every one of those without moving. And that, it sounds silly now, but I'm telling you what, kid, guys, when I was a kid, it was real. I did not let my hand hang over the bed at night out of fear of whatever was in there. And then when the house would settle at night, you know, there was just that creaking... It always started in the kitchen, came through the dining room, living room, hallway, into my bedroom. Every night. And then it would repeat itself. And the fact that nobody ever came and kidnapped me never took away my fear. Every night, it was the same. Every night. It, logic did not kick in. Fear filled my heart. We feel and experience fear at various times. And so what John is also saying, we should be able to feel and experience the reality of God's love as well. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you wake up every day and you feel God's love. But there will be times when we do. And when we're not feeling it, we have the assurance that we are loved so we don't have to wonder, does God love me? And there will be times that you'll need to assure yourself that God love you, loves you even though you're not feeling love, even though you're not experiencing love. You'll need to remind yourself, God loves me even though I don't feel like it right now. And, and that's, that's a, a tremendous help to us. So fear and love are both experiential. Now, now listen to this. Experiencing feel and love are both, to some degree, to some degree, so there's a limit on this, based on belief. I believed in my bedroom at night that someone was coming to get me, and I was afraid. I experienced fear. 
Now, I want to say this. If you're running through the forest in the, in the woods in Yellowstone National Park and you come across a grizzly bear and it's chasing you, uh, no amount of belief is going to keep you from being unafraid, right? Oh, no, this isn't real. This, you know, it's like, no, no. So that's why I'm saying that there, there's a limit to this to some degree, right? But both fear and love are, are based upon belief to some degree. If you do not believe that God loves you, you're not going to be experiencing his love. What you will be doing is every time he shows you, every time he tells you, every time somebody tells you, every time you hear a sermon or somebody says, hey, did you know God loves you, Jesus loves you, do you know what you're going to do? You're going to be like with a ping pong, what you do with a ping pong ball, when somebody hits it to you, you're going to hit it back and say, no, he doesn't, because you don't believe it. And he'll, he'll hit it back. <laughs> he'll keep sending it your way. And you're going to say, no, you might, you might have such a damaged self-image that there's no way that God could love somebody like me. There, there may have been abuse that you've experienced and you wonder. There's all kinds of things that can happen that can cause us to, to doubt that God loves us and, and because of because so many different reasons. But God doesn't stop loving us and he's always reaching out. He's the one that comes to us. And he's seeking after us in his love. He is seeking after us and he doesn't give up. It's an everlasting love. If you believe all spiders and snakes are to be fear, uh, afraid, you will be afraid of the very thought of a spider or a snake. There, there's a, a YouTube video that I've seen a couple times of uh, people floating on a tubes down a stream, and then somebody has a remote-controlled alligator head. <laughs> and they're steering it. You know, here's this tuber that's going, going downstream, you know, and they're just having a good old time until they see that alligator head right there next to them. And all of a sudden, they're like, they're, you know, like, they're freaking out, and then all of a sudden... So it, it, what, what happens? In an inf in a, for a moment, for a moment, they think... They believe it's real, and they react accordingly. That's how belief and these emotions and reactions can be so intricately tied together. But as soon as they realize, oh, this is just a remote control, you know, then all of a sudden the fear goes away and laughter comes, or maybe some anger that somebody did that to them. And, um, you know, again, belief changed their experience. That's the way it works. Much of our fear is based upon belief. Sometimes irrational beliefs. Sometimes beliefs that don't make sense. Like the guy that never broke into my house as a kid and kidnapped me or whatever never happened. And yet every night I was afraid. Logic often doesn't help with the fear but it's based upon belief. So if we can begin to believe, we can begin to believe, is it possible that God could love somebody like me? And then we think, well, I don't, I don't deserve to be loved. And I would say, hey, I'm a charter member of the I Don't Deserve to Be Loved Club. Actually, John was, and Matthew, and Peter. They were the charter members when it came to following Jesus. None of us deserve. Because deserve means I've been so obedient, I've been so outstanding, upstanding, so moral, and so, yeah, nobody's perfect, so I haven't always. No, no, our lives are the opposite of that, and, and we, we've been disobedient, we've sinned, we've gone our own way, we've done our own thing, we have paid no attention to God at times, and, and yet he still loves us, and he always will. So if I believe that God doesn't love me, and God does love me, who's in the wrong? Me or God? So I just, I, just, I just want, sometimes it can help to dismantle our disruptive thinking, disrupt our dysfunctional thinking. And sometimes reasoning things out like that can help. So last week we talked about the Holy Spirit, and one of the things that happens through the Holy Spirit, it tells us this in Romans, as Paul's writing about this in Romans, that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. That's Romans 5.5. 5. 
Well, think that God pours his up because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, comes to live within followers of Christ, and God is love. Guess what's happening when Christ comes to live within you is that love itself has been poured into your heart, and it's experiential, experiential. You'll begin to feel loved. You'll begin to know that you're loved. And one of the things that does that is the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You start thinking, so God gave his son out of his great love. God gave his son for me. He he must really love me. And, And so we begin to experience that. We begin to know that. And we begin to grow in that. So as we move through this, our love for Jesus in reality is in response to his love for us. And our love for him is evidenced by our loving obedience to him. Our love for him is evidenced by our loving obedience to him. So what is obedience without love? Fear. Parents, kids can obey us without loving us. It's because we put the fear of God into their life, right? So there there can be obedience. There there were teachers that I obeyed in school. I certainly did not love them. By the way, you know, every kid knows what teacher they can get away with things with. There was one guy that taught, I don't know, I forget what he taught. Isn't it Mr. Hamilton in middle school? You did not mess with Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Vaughn, on the other hand, you could mess with Mr. Vaughn. You could mess with Mr. Cornett. You you could get away with murder in their classes. Mr. Hamilton, not on your life. Every kid knows that. By the way, they know that with parents, too. They do. Kids are smart. Right? Think back to when you were a kid. You knew that when you were a kid. And sometimes we forget it when we're parents. But anyway... You can, you can be obedient without love. And, and, and obedience without love is fear. It's kind of like paying dues to the mafia so they won't burn down your store. And some people look at obedience to God like that. If I don't walk the straight and narrow, if I don't, you know, then God's going to cause something bad to happen to me. And then when something bad happens, the, the reasoning goes, I wonder what I did wrong. But if something bad happened every time we all did something wrong, We'd all be bandaged and walking around in crutches and both legs and arms broken, our neck and our back and our houses burn up and, you know, and our cars crashed. And if if bad things happen just because we were disobedient, well, God did drown the whole world once because of that. As far as I know, it's never happened since, right? So obedience without love is fear, or it's dry orthodoxy. Dry orthodoxy means correct belief. Correct belief, but dry. Going through the motions. Or it's expecting a return favor. God, this is the opposite of the fear of the mafia response. This is the, hey, God, I'm going I'm to obey, and I'm going to do good, and you owe me. You owe me, and I'm expecting something in return. This is kind of like you scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. You scratch my back, God, and I'll scratch yours. Or if, if I scratch your back, if I, if I do something, if I obey, if I do something kind, then I'm expecting you know, kind to come to me. And, and people who believe in karma kind of feel that way, that there should be a reciprocal There should be, and we expect that. And then when we don't get it, we're hurt, we're offended. And that that attitude can be seen in this kind of statement, I give and I give and I get so little or nothing in return. So you automatically know when somebody says that, they're giving in order to get They're giving in order to get. And so that giving isn't really getting, it's really a payment. 
I'm buying your affection. I am buying your favor. And since I've made this purchase and I don't get what I expected. Now, say nothing. There was nothing negotiated there. There was no. It's just like this un, unspoken, like I expect something to come back to me because I did this. And we can relate to one another that way. And we can relate to God that way too. And if we don't get what we expected, then we're upset, turning away from God. So one, really one last thought. Obedience, is it optional? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Obedience, obedience to Christ, keeping his commands. Is it optional? Uh, it is optional. Um, let me ask you this. Are traffic laws optional? Yes and no. Right? You have the option as whether to follow them or not. And I have a true confession. I, my, my, my goal, I'm 65, I've been driving for 50 years. And my goal was to make it my entire driving career without a speeding ticket. I have failed. <laughs> About a month ago, we're headed down to Circleville to see a Krista in some, oh, as a recital. I almost forgot the event, and uh, I'm just zipping along 68 miles an hour in a 55 zone. I wasn't paying attention to how fast I was going. I've traveled that road a few times. It's a long, narrow straightaway. It's just like real easy to, you know, yeah, anyway, not making excuses. I'm just telling you what I was doing until I didn't pay any attention to how fast I was going until that highway patrol went right past me, and I looked down, and I thought, oh, my gosh, and then I saw him turn around in the road, turn on his lights come after me. So $140 later, you know, I have paid my fines. And, um, but obedience is optional. Consequences are not. Now, to be honest with you, I cannot say I have always gone the speed limit for 50 years. I've been lucky. Uh, and we can all say that, right? If we all got a ticket every time... We went over the speed limit, we'd all be broke. Maybe, I mean, except maybe one. There's one person I've heard in this room that is a turtle on the road. And uh, uh, more power to you, brother. I've also heard that the one pointing at him is like the speed demon on the road. So they balance each other out. So, yeah. Anyway, so. Is obedience optional? Well, yeah. Nobody, nobody's making us. You know, some vehicles have that governor on them that won't go over 55 miles an hour. I mean, maybe that's an old concept, or I don't know. So maybe that's not optional. But just like with speed laws and other kinds of laws, they are optional in terms of I'm deciding I'm going to obey them or not. Often, consequences for disobedience are not optional. They do come our way. But if we go through life like that with Jesus, is obedience to Jesus optional? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. He said many times in this passage, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you will keep my commands. If you don't keep my commands, it's because you don't love me. So here, here's the point. We need... To get to the point where we lovingly... Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, you can just forget what I'm saying. In fact, most of what I've said today really doesn't apply to you. But for those who are in the faith, this applies to every one of us. Obedience is not optional. It's expected. But it's loving obedience. And the double entendre is we should get to the point where we love to be obedient. Because when you trust Jesus and obey him, like the author of that song that we've sung for the last couple, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to what? Trust and obey. Trust him and obey him. Because Father knows best. Father really does know best. And, and when you start 
putting his word into practice in your life, and then you see God come through, you kind of go like, whoa, wow, this obedience thing, it's pretty cool. I think I'll try it again. And then, and then when it works out, because it doesn't mean things aren't hard, uh, or there's not obstacles, but you know, it works out, you kind of go like, wow, obeying him really is the best. Or when you disobey, and then... You know, God does discipline his children out of love. And you experience that. It should be this reminder. You're like, oh, yeah, I need to to get back on track. Now, here's the reality. The more we love Jesus, the more we love obedience to Jesus. The more we love Jesus, the more we love obedience to Jesus. A long time ago, when our daughter Christy was around seven or eight, we lived in Alliance, Ohio, and we're driving, ri- driving, riding our bikes around the neighborhood, and she was on her bike, and she was a little bit ahead of us, and we're coming up to an intersection, and I can still picture this in my mind. And so I'm watching her, and she's not slowing down as she gets to that, close to that intersection. So I yelled, Christy, stop! And guess what she did? She stopped. If she hadn't of, she'd have gone right into the intersection at the time a car was coming the other way with no stop sign in that. And I thought then, if she'd have turned around like, why, Dad? Why should I? What, 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 you know, if there wasn't that unquestioned, immediate obedience, who knows what would have happened on that day? And on a much grander scale, our obedience to Christ is way more important than that. Sometimes we don't know why, but we don't have to know why. Sometimes we get the option, the the opportunity to know why and the what. Often we don't. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do. But it's important to obey because there's someone who is wiser, knows way more than we do, that knows how all things need to fit together, that is directing all things, and if we listen to him and obey him, we begin to see the wisdom of being obedient to him. So if you haven't discovered that yet, I hope you will. I hope you will. And if you haven't discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ yet, I I hope you will. I hope you'll understand this. He was perfect in his obedience. And so he has a perfect record as a human being. And he died on a cross because he took our record of imperfections upon himself. And in exchange for our record of imperfections, he's given us his record of righteousness. And and that's how the believer in Christ can have no fear on judgment day. Because my record of unrighteousness has already been judged. The price has already been paid. Not by me, but by him. He took my record of wrongs to give me his record of right. He bore my sins in his body on the tree. That's what it means that Christ died on the cross for our sins. And then to punctuate it and to prove it, he rose from the dead. Let's pray.